If you follow our mayor on Twitter, you may have seen this slide from May 17. Manager of Economic Development identifies Nova Scotia government as cause of population decline in Nova Scotia and Cape Breton Regional Municipality. That link led to this alarming PowerPoint presentation that shows the population of Nova Scotia plummeting between now and the year 2034. It's startling and alarming. It's almost catastrophic. Except it's not exactly true. This graph uses an old trick to make a modest trend seem dramatic. It truncates the vertical axis. It essentially lops off 800,000 people from a uh, province with a population of only a little over 900,000. The effect is to dramatize a modest decline and make it seem more ominous than it really is. Here it is again, minus the emphasis. Not good, but it's not a calamity. And it's not inevitable. What their kind of forecast does is two things. First, it makes the situation look as horrible as it could possibly be. And second, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It reinforces the notion that it is normal to leave here. It almost seems to say, if you're not following this graph westward, then you're not normal, you're clueless, possibly even stupid. And in either case, you're a failure. But is this really the story of Cape Breton? I moved to Cape Breton in December of 1970. December. I moved to a uh, drafty old farmhouse uh, somewhere around there. Uh, I was 25 years old. <coughs> Excuse me. I was 25 years old. I had a uh, shiny new degree from a great American university and not a clue how to survive a winter in a drafty Cape Breton farmhouse. So my neighbors, who mostly had grade school education at most, took me by the hand and showed me how to get through the winter. They showed me how to bank the house, a concept I'd never heard of. They helped me go down to the shore and gather seaweed that we used to bank the house. They told me how to sharpen a chainsaw and use it to cut the two green firewood that I would use to keep the house warm that winter. Uh, they showed me how to uh, sweat pipes, copper pipes, when the pipes froze in the cold weather. They, one neighbor even lent me his horse, one of his most valuable possessions, to help me gather up the firewood and get it back to the house. And I'm sure there were days that they went home and they said, oh, you won't believe what that fool did today. But to me, they were... Um, friendly and generous and polite, unbelievably generous. And what struck me about this was the incredible range of skills they had. It seemed they could do anything. They could make anything. They could repair anything. They could figure a way out of any scrape that I managed to get us into. And this, this to me, 40 years later, is still the standard of what it is to be a Cape Bretoner. It's what enabled our steel workers to keep the coke ovens and the blast furnace and the open hearth going with vice grips and, and baler's wire for decades. Um, and so uh, when, I, when, I, when I hear the purveyors of uh, depression uh, talk about the need to move westward and so forth. This is what sticks in my mind. This tremendous capacity for hard work that people had when there was work to be done, and a wonderful capacity to play when it was time to play, and the judgment to know the difference between the two. So when I hear the, the, the prophets of despondency tell our young people that their only hope is to move away, and tell the rest of us that our island's only hope is ever expanding subsidies from the rest of Canada, I think that's not the Cape Breton that I know. And it's not the Cape Breton that we are trying to create. We all hear a lot about the negativity and defeatism, the passive acceptance of decline, even the active promotion of decline that especially young people face growing up in Cape Breton. But today we're hearing from people who 
When told there's no opportunity in Cape Breton, simply point to examples of opportunities that exist, opportunities they themselves have taken advantage of. People who, rather than complain that there is no opportunity in Cape Breton, simply go out and create it for themselves. And so it is in this spirit of creating that we present Cape Breton's Wiki, a collaborative tool that we hope will help tell and create Cape Breton stories. Wiki is a Hawaiian word, it means quick. On the web, it refers to websites that can be edited by their users quickly and easily. The most obvious example, of course, being Wikipedia. Cape Breton's Wiki is a type of Wiki known as a city Wiki. It's a Wiki for a particular region. So think Wikipedia for Cape Breton by Cape Bretoners, residents and expats, visitors and admirers. Uh, it combines news, information, and storytelling, but because it's a collaborative tool, it combines crowdsourced data with community sourced news. Entries can include anything from uh, transit schedules to the voting record of your munici municipal councillor, from showtimes at the film series to Fort Max Harvest rules, from a list of traditional foods that can be grown in your Glace Bay garden to a list of wild foods that grow in the area, where to pick them, how to prepare them. It's everything from a phone directory to a virtual community toolkit. The front page of the wiki will be a portal. It will feature uh, hand-picked links to content both within the wiki itself as well as content elsewhere on the web. The goal is to gather and link to as much of the Cape Breton digital footprint as possible and give users some suggestions for how to enter and navigate that terrain. So not long after that first winter that I spent in Cape Breton, CBC Television broadcast a mournful little documentary called The Vanishing Cape Breton Fiddler. Narrator Ron McGuinness uh, described how uh, tenant farmers driven off the highlands of Scotland settled in Cape Breton and brought their fiddles with them and their music with them. And in the new land, the music uh, grew and changed and became a unique art form, Cape Breton fiddling. But sadly, in the early 1970s, it was a dying art form. Only old men were playing the fiddle. And, uh, and, and it was an art form that was threatening to vanish from the landscape, hence the, hence the vanishing Cape Breton fiddler. Now, McGinnis spoke with obvious affection for fiddle music, but fiddle music lovers here took umbrage. They said, we can't allow this to happen. And so they, they, they got together, they pooled their resources, and they organized the Cape Breton Fiddlers Association. And they critically understood that if fiddle music were to survive, they had to interest young people in playing the fiddle. And they were extremely successful. Over the next 10 years, an astonishing uh, resurgence of fiddle playing uh, swept over the western coast of this island. Uh, young people took up the fiddle with alacrity and uh, uh, among teenagers, jigs, reels, and strathbays suddenly became hip. And today, you, you can't go out for a cup of coffee in Inverness County without tripping over a fiddle player. So how did they do it? Well, they didn't moan and complain. They didn't go looking for a lot of government grants. They didn't sue Halifax for inadequate fiddleization. <laughs> they, they collaborated. They worked together. They worked. They played. Uh, and and they, they built an institution from their own skills and their own energy. In fact, in short, what they were was Cape Bretoners. Clay Shirky estimates that it has taken roughly 100 million hours to make Wikipedia. By comparison, Americans alone watch 2 billion hours of television yearly. Someone born in 1960 may have already watched 50,000 hours of TV in their lifetime. That's about five and a half years of their life. What if instead we were to flip that? What would we make? The goal of Cape Breton's wiki is to organize Cape Breton's information in order to inform, entertain, 
educate and organize Cape Retiners. As Scott Heferman of Meetup put it, we need to use the internet to get people off the internet and build a 21st century civil society. The CAP Society, or Community Access Program, is a nonprofit community development organization that uh, uh, provides affordable uh, public access to computer technology and promotes its use for the benefit of the community. The society employs students at CAP sites across the island. Students who are eager to help their communities connect and share online, to join the conversation, to start a conversation, to tell the world who and what they are. With the CAP Society's help, we'll host Wiki Wednesdays or Wiki Weekends even, where people will be able to come together and learn how to use the Wiki to create, share, edit pages, and all the while learn about other communities on the island. And hopefully, learn something new about their own community. The community creates the wiki. The wiki, in turn, helps us create community. And the software makes it surprisingly simple. Uh, what's one thing that you know better than anyone else in Cape Breton? Uh, urban beekeeping, bike lanes, Wi-Fi hotspots, wooden boat building, the Island Community Justice Society, Enterprise Cape Breton Corporation. From watchdogs to dog park, simply visit the website, type your keywords into the search bar up there. If the entry exists, you'll be able to edit it and improve upon it, or just read it and share it. If the entry doesn't exist, you'll be asked if you would like to create it. If you're searching for bike lanes and you don't know where the bike lane is in Cape Breton, uh, it's actually here in member two, <laughs> you can create the entry with just the title and leave the rest of the page blank, thus signaling to others that a query has been made. In this way, the wiki gives us both a mode and a model for voluntary collaborative action. Wikipedia itself seems to have almost prefigured Cape Breton's wiki. This is from the Wikipedia entry for Antigonish movement. It says, in a vision that has been renewed today in uh, digital forms of mass collaboration, Father Moses Cody argued that the only hope for democracy is that enough noble, independent, energetic soul may be found who are willing to work overtime without pay in order to shape a free and prosperous society. To work overtime without pay, in other words, to volunteer. And mass collaboration, this is the collective action of large numbers of people working independently on a single project using social tools. This is embodied in the wiki. So as the uh, uh, Father Cody quote indicates the Fiddlers Association was hardly the only group that ever organized for community benefit in Cape Breton, but it, sort, it created a template that others have used. So today we have the Celtic Colors International Festival of the Arts, the planet's premier Celtic music event. Uh, we've got the uh, Cape Breton Music Industry Association, the Coastal Arts Initiative, the Cabot Trail Writers Festival, uh, all very successful events or organizations. And it's not just in the arts and in music. We've got the Bredore Biosphere Association. And in every little village of Cape Breton, we have a volunteer fire department. Now, by rights, the Ross Ferry Volunteer Fire Department shouldn't exist. E even if you take Kemp's Head and Bulletry Center, there's only about 150 year-round residents in, in Ross Ferry. And it's not really enough to support a proper fire department. But we're also too far away from the nearest other department not to have a fire department. Before there was a Ross Ferry volunteer fire department, it took upwards of an hour for a fire truck to respond in our community. And in 1982, in April, there was a fire that destroyed a family's home in Ross Ferry, very popular family. Uh, the fire started when some cinders from the uh, chimney uh, caught on some shingles at the edge of the roof. Uh, someone passing by saw the fire early and neighbors organized a, a bucket brigade while they waited for the fire truck and they, they carried buckets from or they passed buckets from a farm pond that happened to be near the house. But they were no match for the flames that were leaping through the old dry timbers of this hundred year old house. And by the time the fire truck from Big Bredore arrived, it was a lost cause. So uh, a few weeks later, the same neighbors gathered in Johnny McLean's kitchen. 
and they considered the question of whether it was even conceivable that Ross Ferry could create a fire department. And they reduced the question to its basics. What do we really need? Well, we need a fire truck, and we need a, a, a place to keep it out of the cold in the winter. Well, someone said, you know, a fire truck, what is a fire truck really? It's, it's a truck bed, it's a cab, it's a tank, and it's a pump. And someone else said, well, you know, Smolinars has those old Pepsi delivery trucks up behind the motel there. No, that won't work, said someone. The, 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 the bed on those trucks is too low to the ground. But up behind the Beddows in the woods there, there's an old GMC truck bed that would work perfectly for that. And someone else remembered that at a fabricating shop in North Sydney, there was a tank that had been built for a fire truck, but the, the company that ordered it uh, couldn't pay for it, and it had been there for 10 years, and probably the fabricator would be happy to get it out of the way. And then that brings us to this fellow here, Charlie McPherson, the late Charlie McPherson, who was a mechanic at the Sydney Municipal Bus Garage, who lived at Kemp Head. Uh, Charlie wasn't strong on reading and writing, but he was a genius as a mechanic, a brilliant mechanic. And in June of 1972, he took his two weeks vacation, and with all these parts that the community had assembled, he put together a fire truck, a working fire truck, in two weeks. Total cost, $365.23. And we fought fires in that community for eight years with that fire truck. Today, Ross Ferry has three modern fire trucks, only two of which are shown here because the community is currently gathering money to build a third bay on the side of the community center. The anti ganish movement would, of course, approve. They believed that sustainable community development in Cape Breton required two things. A mature leadership inspired by a constructive alternate vision. They believed that if Cape Bretoners were to be masters of their own destiny, as Cody put, uh, titled his book, they would need to educate and organize themselves. A well-known example of this effort to educate and organize was the People's School. It was established in 1921 at St. Francis Xavier University. Its goals were, I believe, ones we all share. To deal pragmatically and head-on with the challenges facing Cape Breton, to liberate and then put to good use the creative energies of the people, and to inspire them to work together for their common good. It's here amongst these 938,388 people and here in these free hours where we'll find those noble, independent, energetic souls who are committed to creating a 21st century Cape Breton. And they'll do it by building on Cape Breton's greatest asset, its people. We hope you consider this an idea worth spreading and that you'll join us at Cape Breton's wiki, cbwiki.org, and help us tell an old Cape Breton story, one new Cape Breton story at a time. Thank you. Thank you.